I notice uh, that my talk will have non-trivial intersection with several, several other talks that were at this conference before. I will be <coughs> speaking about some joint work with Marco Gualtieri and Eckhart Meinerken. Um, and I, I will try to focus more on ideas than um, more on ideas than uh, technical parts. But if you want to, to have a summary of where I'm heading at, I'm heading at these three results. So th these are results about reduction of certain objects from infinite dimensions to finite dimensions, or in general, reduction of certain objects, then morphisms between them. And thirdly, there is an application uh, to geometry on Lie groups and moduli spaces. <coughs> Okay, it will take me a bit uh, of time to introduce what the objects are. But if you remember Eckhart's talk about Dirac geometry, Dirac Lie groups, this would be, help a lot. Uh, okay. Okay, some introduction. Uh, if you're not familiar with the objects that I'm, I will be working with, you might get a bit lost, but I want you to have this uh, principle in mind. So the, the idea is based on a shift of um, perspective, similar to the shift of perspective between functions and relations. Uh, so Poisson symplectic geometry can be described in many terms. One possible term is in terms of functions, it's a particular function that takes a covector to a vector, satisfying two properties, so skew symmetry and integrability, so Jacobi identity. And it was noticed by Ted Coolant and Alan Weinstein that if you think of the graph of this map here, uh, these two conditions can be actually expressed in terms of the graph as a subspace as a sub-bundle, because this ambient T plus T star, this double tangent bundle, uh, has a natural structure in it, which allows you to do that, to express these two conditions. And uh, as Eckhart also remarked, th the name of Dirac, it's related to the fact that these are well-behaved under restriction to submanifolds, so constraints. And it's a reference to Dirac's work on constraints. So, but this is not why I will be considering this kind of geometry, but rather because it's well suited to describe infinite dimensional geometry. And if there is any message of the talk that I want you to keep is, is this, that this kind of Dirac geometry is well suited for infinite dimensions, M more than the technical parts that you might probably forget very quickly. The motivation for this is, is the following. In finite dimensions, if you have a principal bundle with an invariant Poisson structure, then it pushes forward to the base. But in infinite dimensions, uh, you know, this uh, might not work. In particular, there is one um, kill of constant type of linear Poisson structure on this dual of a central extension of a loop algebra. And because the central extension involves taking a derivative, you have to be careful that not every function or functional you can actually bracket. There is a domain in this bracket. And in particular, the basic functions that you would like to bracket to induce the, the bracket on the base uh, are not well defined. And again, the main idea, or yeah, the main idea is to, to actually see what is going on in this particular example is to use, instead of Poisson structure, Dirac structures. And this shift of perspective is kind of enough. And then instead of push forward, just use a general reduction procedure for this, these objects. Uh, so 
this is this problem is related to this third uh, result that I'm going to speak about. The two, the two first two results are general theory, and the third one is the application to this particular problem. Um, I should also mention that, you know, why would you do this? It's because the, the geometry that is induced on this Lie group G, it's well known and it has some properties, but these properties are, uh, you know, more transparent before reduction. So before reduction, you notice that there is an obvious property that carries over to the quotient. And also there are other sort of operations that you can do which are more transparent in infinite dimensions. And this last part is also pretty much related to David's course on moduli spaces in the, in the school. Okay, so <clears throat> what I'm going to do now is uh, describe the linear version of this geometry. I will be thinking of topological spaces, possibly infinite dimensional, where the topology is of Hilbert type, but the inner product is not really part of the structure. Rather, we consider an additional information which is uh, a pseudo metric. So it's symmetric, continuous, non-degenerate, but it doesn't have to be positive definite. It's just an, an extra piece of information. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. I'm going to use just the topology and the fact that every closed subspace has a closed complement. So this is the key example. Uh, this, this shift of perspective from functions to relations is used in functional analysis. For example, if you want to speak about when a, an operator is skewed adjoint, you can just think of the graph as a subspace of this double construction, and it will be skew if and only if it is Lagrangian, so it equals its uh, orthogonal. I will be a bit more concrete with a simple example for us to have in mind. If you have, let's say, we take L2 functions on an interval. And I want to consider this particular operator that takes a function to its derivative. Of course, this operator is not defined on any function, but you need to require some regularity. So the, the domain are the functions which are sub of h1. <laughs> and also, let, let us wonder when is this operator skew symmetric or skew adjoint. So according to this definition, you should, let's say, first check that it's isotropic. So you take one element in the graph, you take another element in the graph, and this should be zero. If you trace back the definition of this metric or pseudo metric, this in this particular case equals the integral from zero to one of s prime f prime g plus f g prime. And then by the fundamental theorem of calculus, this is just f times g at one minus f times g at zero. So you see that for this to be skew adjoint, of course this is very well known. You need a, let's say, periodic boundary conditions. But it's important, something that I want to keep about this, also besides <laughs> the boundary conditions, is the, the fact that the operator is not everywhere defined and when you, for example, consider these central extensions of the algebras, this is exactly the same phenomenon that happens. And the operator itself can be better described uh, in terms of its graph. So morphisms, it will be in the same spirit of Alan's talk and David's talk. 
So we consider Lagrangian relations, but now the, the linear product, this pseudometric is symmetric, not skew. And of course, uh, maps become morphisms in this double construction, but there are others, for example, the one you can twist the natural relation given by a map by a two-form. Okay, so now I will speak about the linear version of reduction, of, of this reduction procedure that I'm going to focus on. Of course, there is nothing new. It's, uh, it's reminiscent of symplectic reduction. You take a quisotropic subspace and you divide by its orthogonal. Uh, this induces, uh, again, a pseudometric on this quotient. And you can also redu reduce subspaces. And as Alan mentioned, th these kind of linear relations, when you compose them as relations, the composition coincides with a reduction procedure. But, you know, in, in infinite dimensions, in general, one has to be careful. And here, uh, it's important, th this fact, that if you reduce a Lagrangian subspace, the result might not be Lagrangian. And also, composition of Lagrangian relations might not be Lagrangian. And one condition that ensures this is that this sum of subspaces is closed. You know, in infinite dimensions, you have two closed subspaces, you sum them, and it might not be closed. Of course, this is something that is not seen in finite dimensions. And in particular, this transversality condition for composition is enough to ensure that the result is Lagrangian. And this is basically it. This is the linear, <laughs> linear reduction. I, I want to say something here related to this example. We can define this subspace of So elements like this that I will denote rho of f. It turns out that this subspace is uh, quisotropic. Actually, it's orthogonal. You can verify using the definition of the de a weak derivative that the, the orthogonal is, is also given like this. This expression where this is also admits one derivative and trivial boundary conditions. So here there are no boundary conditions, and here you get trivial just by taking the orthogonal. So when you do the quotient, the information that you retain, it's only the values of the function at the endpoints of the interval. So if, if you make, let's say that this is I do like this so that you can see that so this bar there is related to this minus sign here in the fundamental theory of, of calculus and so after reduction what we remember is the boundary values and if you reduce this graph of the the operator Of course, what you get is uh, it's a subset of this, which is the diagonal, right? Because I, I was imposing periodic boundary conditions. So in Rn, this is the inner product. And you see that this condition can be generalized to saying that f of 0, f of 1, lies in a subspace of the product. which is Lagrangian, so that this is always zero. So it, this subspace S, it's, uh, it plays the role of the boundary conditions. And they, we ask them to be Lagrangian. And so in this case, after reduction, what you would get is exactly the boundary conditions information. <coughs> uh, 
In a sense, this result three is exactly this example, but not for just one operator, but to a family parameterized by a connection. That's why we get model A spaces of connections. So, okay. Now I'm going to, going to pass from the linear geometry to geometry. And I won't be paying much attention. So the new ingredient, of course, is that now you have a bundle over a manifold. And there is some differential geometric information encoded in the form of a bracket and an anchor. Uh, I won't pay, be paying much attention to that because there is this phenomenon, and this is also something that I want to stress about this shift of perspective to relations, that um, once you have taken care of the linear algebra part, the, the bracket part, so the integrability part, just goes along. You don't have to give new arguments for it. And this is also something very interesting. For example, you can remember Eckhart's proof of Dreamfeld's, Dreamfeld's classification of Poisson group, which was very uh, short. And the focus was on the, on the linear algebra part. This phenomenon, it's also something that, that becomes interesting for, the, for this application. So as I was saying, the new, now you have a bundle. The base can also be infinite dimensional. I will be thinking of Hilbert manifolds. And there is this bracket and, and this anchor satisfying these conditions that might look a bit weird uh, at first. They, they, they are some sort of up to homotopy Lie algebra because skew symmetry, for example, is <coughs> defined up to a term. And one conceptual way of understanding what these objects are is to think of supermanifolds. This was discovered by Dimitri Reutenberg. So this data is equivalent to a symplectic manifold only in a different category, in the category of supermanifolds of a certain particular type. And I also say that the the Lagrangian relations that Alan was talking in the symplectic category, with this identification, they become the relations that I am speaking about. So super symplectic forms can be something symmetric, not just anti-symmetric. There are these examples where the bracket comes from the action of vector fields by Lie derivatives. You can also uh, twist this natural standard bracket by a closed three form. And this corresponds to a class of current algebra it's called exact. So more intrinsically, it's a current algebra such that this natural sequence is exact. And if you split it, then you get an isomorphism to one of these twisted ones. And of course, the free form that appears depends on the splitting, but its class doesn't. This is called the Chevera class of the exact current algebra. Another uh, source of examples comes from Lie algebras. This will be also important in this talk. In particular, a Lie algebra can be seen as a current algebra over a point as long as it has an invariant metric on it. More generally, if you have an action of such a Lie algebra, which is compatible with the metric or the pseudometric, in the sense that the stabilizers are quisotropic, then you get a, an action current algebra. Of particular interest for us in this result three will be this example where you take this double H acting by left and right on the underlying Lie group, and then you get this action current algebra called the Cartan current algebra. And Cartan's name is because is there because this is exact, and the three-form class, it's the Cartan three-form. So now, this is the geometric version of the object, and now I'll pass to describe sub-objects, which are called Dirac structures. So again, it's a, it's a sub-bundle, so that each fiber is Lagrangian, and there is this involutivity 
condition, integrability condition that the sections are closed under the bracket. You can also define it along submanifolds, and you can see that the bracket and the anchor uh, induce a Lie algebra structure. Of course, one example is the example that I mentioned in the beginning. If you have a Dirac structure that is transverse to the tangent bundle, then this is equivalent to a Poisson structure. And in this Hilbert con context, this is equivalent to have uh, strong symplectic leaves whenever the leaves exist. But in infinite dimensions, this trivial inter intersection condition does not guarantee the transversality. So you can have two Lagrangians which intersect trivially, but yet the, the sum is not everything. And this is directly related to the fact that the domain, uh, for example here, the domain is, is not everything. We call this a uh, weak Poisson structure just because, or in particular because there is an induced two form on, a, on an orbit which is weakly symplectic. Uh, another example is related to this one. So if in the double you choose a Lagrangian subalgebra, then you get uh, something called the Cartan Dirac, or, okay, for any Cartan, for, for any Lagrangian subalgebra, you get this Dirac structure, E, S. In particular, if you take the diagonal, similar to what I was doing there at first, then you get the so-called Cartan Dirac structure. And this turns out to be related to group-valued moment maps and quasi-Hamiltonian spaces, and so transitively related to modelized spaces of flat connections. Okay, now the geometric version of morphisms. Again, they are relations which are Lagrangian and they satisfy this further integrability condition. So they are Dirac structures along some map. Um, if you have a pair, so an object and a sub-object, a map of, pair of, of pairs is one that is such that the relation relates the sub-objects like that. And we also put this uh, technical condition that this composition is transverse. Uh, if you know a bit about it, this corresponds to strong forward Dirac maps. Again, just ordinary maps between manifold induce these morphisms and you can twist them by two forms. These are called full. Uh, Okay, so the final uh, definition before going to reduction is that, um, so the fact that maps generate actions, pretty much like when you have a, a map to the dual of a Lie algebra, it generates a Hamiltonian action on a symplectic manifold. So uh, maps like this, we call them Hamiltonian spaces. And indeed, this, on the domain, there is this TM in the pair as a sub-object. And it's because the relation relates elements of E, which is a Lie algebra, to tangent vectors, so vector fields. So you have a Lie algebra action on M. In particular, if you have this particular class of full morphisms, you see that, which are defined by a, a map and a two-form, uh, you get a, a moment map condition for the action, but the form doesn't need to be uh, closed if there is a twist. And also, it doesn't have to be non-degenerate. There is a weakly non-degenerate condition hidden in the fact that this is a morphism. So saying that this is a morphism it encodes, uh, just in that, it encodes all sorts of properties. <laughs> in particular, it, it actually generalizes all the moment map notions. So for Poisson manifolds and also group, Lie group valued moment maps and, and some others too. Okay. Uh, any question about this? Um, 
Now I'll go to this reduction part where the results leave. So, okay, reduction. The idea is that now we have this category of objects and sub-objects. And so first I'm going to say what a, an action by symmetries there is, and then I'm going to describe how to reduce them to a quotient. So symmetries are derivations of both the, the bracket and the, and the inner product, or the, sorry, the pseudometric. Some of the derivations are inner because you have the bracket, and we will focus on actions which are inner. So this is similar to having Hamiltonian actions. So not just vector fields, but Hamiltonian vector fields. In particular, if these generators are isotropic, then you have a quisotropic subspace naturally defined. And the theorem, which comes from this original paper of Enrique, Marco, and Gilles, is that if you do linear reduction on each fiber, the result is G-equivariant, so it comes from a bundle on the quotient. And this bundle on the quotient inherits a current algebraic structure from the unreduced space. And if you have a, a Dirac structure, so a sub-object, it also reduces as long as this sum is closed. This is something that we observed in the linear case. So again, the, the focus is on the linear part. So you do fiber-wise reduction, linear reduction, and then everything comes along uh, naturally. Of course, if you have an honest Poisson structure, um, and you use a trivial extension of the action, the reduction coincides with the push forward. So it's, it's also an honest generalization of push forward. The theorem two is, I'm condensing this in, in this theorem two, it's about reduction of morphisms. So the picture is like this, that you have one of these objects and a sub-object, another one, and then you have some action here, extended action, you have some other action here, and you have a morphism. Uh, the idea is that if, if this morphism is equivalent so that it relates this, this action to that action, then this reduces. It reduces like this, where these are quotient relations, which are, happen to be morphisms. So this theorem is basically saying this, that under certain hypotheses, you can, for example, this hypothesis that is in, in item two, it's related to the fact that in the definition of a morphism of pairs, there was a transversality condition, and this is a condition that ensures transversality after the reduction. Uh, so finally, okay. I'm going pretty fast. Um, when you have exact current algebra, remember the exact current algebra is where those that you can split them into T and T star. If you have one of those, you might want also to reduce the splitting. And so we have also this result that you can produce basic splittings, so splittings that go to the base by having G invariants and the choice of a connection. This has an interpretation in terms of equivariant cohomology, and it's also interesting that in the context of loop groups and so on, uh, 
particular choices of principal connections leads to known formulas uh, for these two form var pi. Uh, so it, it gives some nice explanation in this context for some formulas that were known before. If I have time, since I'm going pretty fast, I will explain this more. Okay, so summing up, there are these objects which are current algebras, they have sub-objects which are Dirac structures and they generalize Poisson geometry. Uh, there, there is a generalized notion of morphisms according to this general principle that you think of relations. And of course, if you have symmetries in the appropriate sense, you have reduction procedures, which generalize push forwards. So now I go back to the original uh, example that motivated this, which is uh, these spaces of connections over an interval or, or a circle. So what I'm going to try to do in the end is to give a, a nicer framework for this period of Poisson bracket on the dual of the loop algebra, eccentric extension. We consider this uh, space of one forms and we think of them as giving principal connections on a trivial bundle. And we pick some Sobolev regularity class of such connections. So automorphisms of this bundle over I act by gauge transformations on the space of connections. And the action is written there, but the action involves taking a derivative. So you actually need one more regularity. So one, the existence of one more derivative in the transformations than in the connections themselves. Now, a fact about this is that if you, if you pick a connection and you take the allonomy along the interval, this defines an element on the group. And this is this map whole. And it happens to be a principal bundle for a subgroup of gauge transformations which are trivial on the boundary. This, I hope, is reminiscent to this C perp, where you had functions which were, which had trivial boundary conditions. And after you reduce, you get this. So the values on the boundary. Uh, you can interpret this as, uh, as, as having a framing at the endpoints of the interval. And, okay, what I'm going to show is that this action of gauge transformations has an extension in the sense that I was saying before. So in particular, there will be something on the tangent space and something in the cotangent space. These were the generators as I defined them. On the tan tangent space is the usual infinitesimal gauge action. So it's given by the, by the covariant version of the, of the RAM differential from zero forms to one forms. So once you have a connection A, you have the covariant version of the RAM differential, DA. And the notation, I chose it so that it's basically that example, but now on a family. So for each parameter A, which is a connection, you have an operator, DA. And of course the cotangent space is the topological dual, but the presence of a metric in the Lie algebra, so a pseudo-metric, it doesn't have to be positive definite, uh, allows you to, to take a zero form and view it as a functional on one forms. Because you can do this dot product to get a number and then integrate. So these numbers zero and one is because the interval is one dimensional. If you had a two dimensional, then it would be for example, zero and two or one and one. It's just a matter of summing up the degrees of the forms when you integrate. So if you put these two things together, what happens in the tangent bundle and in the cotangent bundle th with this map uh, rho or var rho, what, what you show is that this defines an extension of the gauge action. 
And moreover, if you restrict them, if you restrict the action to this subgroup of, or sub-algebra of gauge transformations with boundary conditions, pretty much as we did there, we get uh, Dirac structures, as long as these boundary conditions are Lagrangian. The integrability follows from being a subalgebra, and uh, the fact that the fibers are Dirac comes from the fact that the Lagrangian, the subalgebra is Lagrangian. Moreover, these Dirac structures have trivial intersection with the tangent bundle, so they are weak Poisson. They are not honest Poisson. I mean, they cannot be extended to honest Poisson precisely because the domain of this operator is not everything. So the moral of this part is that if you take diagonal, so periodic boundary conditions, this is what, I mean, this is a, a nice description of this uh, Kirillov Poisson structure. But in terms of relations and not of a bilinear operation as a bracket. So unlike the Poisson presentation, this Dirac presentation, it's amenable to reduction. So, and what you get is, um, is this theorem three. So this is the third result that I was announcing there. If you reduce along this holonomy vibration from infinite dimensions to finite dimensions, and the only, uh, the geometry that is encoded everywhere, so in principle, before reduction, is just the, the, um, the metric on the Lie algebra. So the metric on the Lie algebra induces this geometry, and you reduce it, and you get this cartan current algebra. And actually, you get more. The, this identification, there is a residual action from this kind of phenomenon where you, when you quotient, you still get the boundary values. The residual action is also extended, and there is also a splitting, as I was saying before, coming from a choice of connection, and, and this natural isomorphism is compatible with all of those. If you reduce this weak Poisson structure or, weak or Dirac structures, in particular, you get the Cartan Dirac structure. Yeah, there shouldn't be a red thing. Ah, yeah, it is correct. And if you use the result about reduction of morphisms, so now Hamiltonian spaces are morphisms like this. So in principle, you can also reduce them to get a morphism, which is again a Hamiltonian space. So, and you can also go back uh, to establish a one-to-one -one correspondence between these infinite dimensional Hamiltonian spaces to finite dimensional Hamiltonian spaces. This recovers the result that Sue Tolman was referring to in this paper by Alexeyev, Malkin, and Marilkin about loop, ham, loop group Hamiltonian spaces and quasi Hamiltonian spaces with group valued moment maps as a particular case. But it, it encodes more than that. And, and also, it's a shift of perspective in, in that result. So uh, once you phrase everything in terms of these relations, it's not so strange that before you had something symplectic, so a symplectic LG space, and now you have something that is not symplectic. But because we shifted the perspective, you know, this R is as good as this R red. In particular, full morphisms go to full morphisms. And another thing that I want to say is that this is not the only place where such a reduction procedure, like current reduction, was used to, the f to study finite dimensional geometry and moduli spaces. There is this paper where they also use uh, reduction, but now for generalized scalar, which also in includes this, involves this double tangent bundle for instant on moduli spaces on four manifolds. And again, if I'm not mistaken, there is this miracle in which 
you, you look at the linear geometry and then the, the integrability part, it, it just goes along. You don't, you don't need to take care of it independently. Okay. What else? Uh, I also want to say that viewing differential operators as Dirac structures is not, it, it's also something that other people have considered before, in particular in the context of um, geometric mechanics and control theory, the group of Marsden. There are several papers, and they even, they also consider reduction procedures. What, what is a bit different here is that after reduction, we get nonlinear spaces, so we, we get a Lie group, and their cases, they were mostly linear spaces. Any question about this? Well, I guess nobody will complain if I finish early. <laughs> okay, now I just give a list of other applications of this. As I said before, uh, I don't know, personally, I don't consider the results themselves as, as important as the fact of identifying this geometry as good for infinite dimensions. And I, I'm sure that there are many other applications other than these spaces of flat connections or connections. Okay, first thing that I want to say is that uh, there was this, uh, there is an appendix in this paper by Anton, Yvette, and Eckhart where you take this formal Kirillov by vector and formally push it forward. And the result is something that makes sense. It's called, it's known, it's a quasi Poisson by vector. But what is disturbing is that before you were interpreting this as a Poisson structure, so it was integrable. And after this, it's not integrable, it's quasi Poisson. So it doesn't satisfy the Jacobi identity. And from this perspective, you can show that what happens is actually that these holonomy functions were not in the domain, but you can twist it so that it is in the domain and the proper, I mean, this rigorous reduction procedure leads you to the bivector. Another remark that I want to make is that, as I was saying, there was a, in the extension of the action, there was a counting of degrees of forms based on the dimension of the interval. So a circle works just as, just as well. So you can consider the space of connections over a circle, and there is another way in, you c in which you can generalize the previous theorem, which is that you can consider marked points, so morally framing at this point, framings at this point, and holonomies like this on these subintervals. And you can also perform reduction under this uh, more general holonomy associated to, associated to, the, to the points. And uh, in terms of the current geometry, you don't get nothing, anything new. You just get products. But the current, sorry, the, the Dirac structures, um, they are new. So it, it, you don't get you know, one Dirac structure for each copy and just take the product. It's something else. It's related to, if you have a gauge transformation here, so what here is an endpoint, it's an initial point for the next one, and so on. It, and the formula is exactly the one that Lou was doing in, his talk, in her talk, um, where, where you take n copies of a double, and you have this kind of, um, maybe I just write it. So it, it was something like this, Q1, G1, then G1 inverse Q2, G2, G2 inverse Q3, and so on. And the fact that this is the inverse of this, it's related to what I was saying. If you interpret this as a gauge transformation related to this point, here is final, so it, it comes with a minus one, and in the other one is initial, so it comes with it as it is. 
In particular, there is, there is an interesting class related to these circles with mark points, or you can also think of polygons that David and Pavel Chevere considered and probably spoke about in his mini course. And these are very interesting to, in their work to uh, construct moduli spaces by gluing simplices. Um, another thing that I want to say is that if you consider spaces of connections over surfaces, now this counting of, of degrees of forms based on the dimension of the manifold, what it gives you is this at about two form. So the, 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 the metric on the Lie algebra induces this at about two form. And in our context, I, I will see the two form as are as giving a morphism. In particular, uh, for example, if you have a surface with boundary, then you have a, a morphism, a full morphism associated with it, which is restrict the connection to the boundary and twist the relation by the two form. And this is nothing else than the the usual loop group symmetry that you have on the space of, of connections associated to the boundary. So it's a, it's a relation Hamiltonian space description of something that is well known. And again, the, the shift of perspective allows you to see, I mean, not to be surprised when after reduction you get something that is not symplectic. There is also something very interesting that it's also in the work of Eckhart and in his talk and of David that this cartan current algebra Good, so I have three more minutes. I'm almost done. So this is, this is some object and some, so it's a pair over a Lie group and as itself, you know, as a pair, it's also a multiplicative type of object. It's a group-like object. It's a Dirac Lie group. And you can see why this is true by considering a two-simplex or a smooth inversion. So a circle with three mark points, so a, a disk with three mark points in the boundary. Orientations like this. <coughs> and I'm basically repeating this argument that I was saying about reduction, the graph of multiplication on this comes from this moduli space of connections on the disk. And what I put in this slide is that it was known from, from all these people, Sullivan, then Chevera took it, and Enriquez also, for N infinities and N infinity algebra, that multiplicative structures are related to moduli spaces of, cert of flat connections on two simplex. This is well known. There are also extrinsic type of properties that these guys have. Sorry, this should be delta. So operations called fusion and sewing that also admit this kind of infinite to finite description. Uh, there's something interesting that related to, to this circle with mark points, there is a Dirac structure, finite dimensional Dirac structure in n copies of this that I was saying that it's not just a product. And it, if you integrate it as a Lie algebra, it's well known, I mean, it's known from the work of Enrique, Alan, who else, Marius, and Zhu, that the groupoid that integrates this algebra has a presymplectic form with minimal sort of non-degeneracy. And again, the, the integrating groupoid comes from considering connections, so the infinite dimensional space of connections on a cylinder, 
where you have marked points in the boundary. And restriction to these are the to this one and to this one are the source and target maps. And moreover, if you mark endpoints here and endpoints there, you don't get a groupoid, but you get a Morita equivalence in the sense of Ping Shu. And as a final comment, which is kind of putting this into a bigger perspective, uh, so there is this idea of taking manifolds of different dimensions, zero, one, two, three, and it could be more, but in this particular case, it stops at three, and assigning to them certain spaces or with geometry. This idea, it, it's, it comes from field theory, it's called extend, extended topological field theory. And, <clears throat> and the idea is that this assignment has some certain functorial-like properties. For example, if you think of on the left side of covardisms as, as morphisms and so on. And the idea here would be that, that this uh, description in terms of relations and so on could give a, a rigorous framework uh, a priori to, to describe this as a functor. And actually, moreover, you could choose these families of points and do a reduction to get a finite dimensional description. But this procedure, the nice thing is that it, it's rigorous. And there, there are these questions that might make sense to some. But OK, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Yeah, I think, uh, of course, you will need some sort of skew symmetry to speak about Dirac structures. But uh, uh, as I was saying, for example, there are some fluid equations that people have you know, interpreted as uh, Dirac structures and so on. So yeah, in principle, it's doable. And it might lead to interesting things as well. <laughs>